come. And so today I'm going to speak, we talked about maybe 75% of it will be about my practice as an artist and what I'm working on and have been, it's mostly somewhat recent work and some of it is exactly in progress right now and then looks at some things from, uh, most of it's from the last four years in general. Uh, though there's a few things that go back in time for context, but mostly it's, it's recent work. And uh, then the other 25% of what I would like to speak of is, is uh, what I can be of help to you in terms of questions you might have about um, not only how do I go about making art, but how do I remain motivated as an artist, and uh, how have I created, invented a, uh, an art career for myself, and uh, I think that those are really important things to give some thought of as you're you know, leaving school and to kind of have a bit of a game plan and some goals and we can uh, you know, brainstorm about that a little bit. So I, I do hope to sort of pepper the talk with some of those things of, of um, why I was doing it and the context I was doing it and some of the decisions I, I was making and how that connected to my career as an, as an artist. So we can maybe, uh, before some of the other guests come, we can talk a little bit about the background. It doesn't take away too much from that, because uh, it's um, important to know. Uh, I, I Right after high school, like a lot of you, I, I went to college, and I, I, uh, I chose to go to Carnegie Mellon University School of Art, um, which turned out to be a momentous you know, life decision in that I think where you go to school uh, really informs you as an artist and I would probably be a completely different type of artist I, I've come to the conclusion later in life if I had gone to that that school which is a very I didn't realize it at the time I just thought I was you know in art school but it's a very particular type of school it's it, it has a very conceptual base. It was sort of assumed of us that we were going to go on and uh, be contemporary artists and really try to have a large career and uh, uh, interact in some way, if not living and working, uh, uh, interact in other ways with major art centers like New York City was sort of this undercurrent subconscious uh, uh, expectation that we were picking up as students. Um, I don't think that's always the case, but it was sort of very ambitious like that. But meanwhile, there was a really strong foundational uh, bent to the school, not just uh, about ideas and concepts, but really learning tools. Drawing was very important there. I'm going to start with drawing and uh, the idea of being a sketchbook artist was something that was uh, encouraged. And um, it took me a while as an artist to kind of catch up with that idea. It's, it, the idea is kind of having a daily practice, uh, at least weekly, with your own sketchbook. is the place to work out ideas, to plan. To, that for every type of artist, there's a, another type of sketchbook that it's not a one, you know, one way of doing it. Um, some people are diary-like journals with pictures in between. Some people cut things out of magazines and paste them in. I'm sure you have experienced. How many people know what, you know, experience this? Yeah, okay. So, um, and there was some people there who you know, truly this was a natural fit for them and they were always drawing something. Uh, um, my schoolmate, uh, John Curran, who's gone on to have a wonderful career, was this type of sketchbook artist immediately. And, and our, uh, my schoolmates that were this type of artist would, they'd be drawing their, uh, their mug, their roommate's shoes. Their, so on, on critique day, 
uh, they, they would plaster the wall with all these you know, beautifully rendered drawings uh, of, of everyday life that they were always honing their, their, their skills. They put a lot of time and effort into, into learning that. They took anatomy classes, and so I, I think it was really important uh, in my training to really learn, learn my craft, and I, I'm really glad that I did, because that's something you build on your whole life. You can't fudge it. You really need to know how to draw and paint. Then if you don't go on to all, necessarily using those in your practice, you still are always able to come back to that in some way. It informs your, your whatever you end up doing, I think. This is an example of how I use drawing to plan, uh, I, to work out ideas for, for my, my, uh, my paintings. Uh, or I might be for an installation or for a certain situation, but it's a way for me to, to kind of work through ideas. And in this case, uh, since my paintings, as you will see, are, are rather dimensional, they're not uh, just strictly a, a two-dimensional surface, I'm, I'm planning how to make the painting three different ways with different types of color, and I'm putting them since they are dimensional, in a space. So I'm adding a little bit of a floor, a little bit of a electric outlet for, for scale, and, and also to have a like, little bit of a humor by having the outlet that strikes me as kind of funny. And um, I think that the, uh, ultimately the paintings have a bit of sense of humor too about something that is uh, falling down and coming out of, of something else. So some of the works we're going to be looking at in my paintings are, are uh, developing out of heart shapes, starting with that iconic, rather overused you know, shape in our culture. So how does an artist bring something new to something that is really so, uh, really become kind of trite? So the first one was looking at some planning, uh, planning drawings, approaching drawing as a way to figure out something else but still thinking of them as a work of art, not just as a study. I don't think of studies as you know, something secondary. They're still a work of art unto themselves. These are more from thinking about drawing as diary-like. They come out of wanting to make a drawing. And uh, out of 28 drawings here, these, these are gleaned out of six different sketchbooks, different sizes, that were going over a four-year period. And then editing out and deciding which ones I, I like a lot and uh, which ones might look good together in a grouping. And then, as you will see throughout my presentation, that uh, color and light are extremely important to me as well as sight and sight specificness, making something really belong where it is, is very important to me. So you see that in the, uh, that I developed this uh, uh, methodology of painting the backs of works of art with fluorescent paint so that, that uh, it glows onto the wall and it gives the work of art its own aura. And then it becomes, in this case, very site-specific to the wall. It kind of owns you know, its space in the wall. And uh, even then, if these end up being uh, purchased and framed, they can glow you know, inside, inside the frame against the white mat. different ways I utilize drawing. So we talked about the diary-like spontaneous approach. I use it to build and hone technical skills as a collaboration with others. Uh, example is with that is that uh, today my, my nephew Daniel is here and last summer we were making a drawing together that that I would make a mark, that he would make a mark, and we made that uh, uh, chimney drawing, remember? So uh, uh, another way is 
studies, planning ideas for paintings and installations. Um, they might be uh, to really not just uh, a study is maybe more for myself initially, but uh, it's related to something that's a proposal for a commission or a public pro project that um, then it might be something that others are going to be to be also looking at uh, in a different way than in the gallery I might show a study but for a proposal I may be showing a committee people who have to understand what I want to, to achieve S then uh, studying the work the art of others uh, in other words the long tradition of artists copying other artists work it's a bit kind of uh, old-fashioned to some to some people's working practice today I I think it has uh, a merit to it as you may know that that was kind of what one used to do in art school uh, way before our time they would draw plaster casts of Greek and Roman sculpture to learn to draw the figure there wasn't a live model they would study uh, uh, other people's art by copying it and uh, I like to do that to some extent I work in series and one-offs uh, and sometimes a one-off uh, may turn into a series in time and then uh, sometimes I incorporate text so I selected the the drawing here because it utilizes a lot of these things it's uh, I'm drawing somebody else's work this is a sculpture in the Tuileries Gardens by Henri uh, Vidal. It's of Cain coming from having killed his brother Abel. It's a very serious, tragic piece. I'm turning it into something um, very uh, silly and uh, comical, uh, which is sort of a, a postmodern way of, of, of working, where I, I'm then adding uh, my proposal of putting this, this humorous long braid uh, in it and that the suddenly the narrative has shifted because now the character is sort of seems to be mourning uh, you know, the, the cut braid and uh, so then I did go on to do this in, in, in Paris and, uh, and and documented it so it was a, a way for me to plan what I was going to do uh, it was something very quick it was an intervention I set it up before the guards came and got me, kicked me out of there, I documented it and took it away. Then that photograph can you know, live further and that can be exhibited uh, and live on. Uh, it also shows uh, a way of uh, honing my skills. I, I love to hone my skills by working from the figure. What else does it do? Uh, and then it's, uh, you know, it's a planning for, it's a proposal project. Uh, and it does incorporate text too, because uh, I'm basically writing a lot of this into the drawing and being proud of that. Uh, one thing I remember from, from undergraduate studies was one of our teachers said, you know, you have to sign your work, kids. You can't kind of get out of that. Uh, that should be part of your thinking. Like, where am I going to put the signature? It's so awkward. And you notice that a lot of work, contemporary work we see, doesn't have a signature. And you know, that's, that's well and good, that's, that's an artist's decision, but uh, that teacher was challenging us to sort of not take that, that, that route, you know, always, that the signature can somehow be incorporated. And think about that as a compositional element. So I'm gonna start with uh, what looks at a series of diary-like drawings. These, uh, though big, these are actually you know small black sketchbook that you can carry around with yourself. And the title becomes the date. The date isn't necessarily the day I started it and finished it. I might have started it and worked on it for several days, but the day that I, I sign it, and and uh, then I, I'm calling it complete. Uh, the day you get it framed, that it's really complete. <laughs> Are, are, are photographed, uh, you know, for it to be then officially going to be shown. Then it, you've got to you know, know when it's over. But um, that's, that's what I'm getting at with the date. And uh, as you'll see, 
in my paintings that were coming up, I used, uh, using a lot of arrows. And uh, so I decided in, in the course of working in the sketchbook over time, that was an image I decided to do a little series that used, used arrows. You know, it's a great way of honing skills, too, to try to do something realistic like that. If anybody comes up with a question while I'm speaking, please feel free to ask. I won't consider it an interruption. You can raise your hand or you can just you know, say it out loud. That's fine. Yes? May I ask what, what spawned your fascination with arrows? Yeah, yes. Uh, I, was looking for, I was looking for something to support my paintings, physically support them, since, as you'll see soon, my paintings are on a flimsy material. They're on th a thick vinyl, which is like a very, very, very thick shower curtain. And so how are you going to hang that? And how is it going to come off the wall? And, and I was looking for a prop, really. And the arrow uh, fit in with, with my narrative that I was developing, because the painting series was developing uh, arrow sh uh, heart shapes. So that sort of you know, trite kind of uh, connection, hearts and arrows, I thought I could do a lot with it. And an arrow you know, gives you this much space to have the painting come off the wall. So that really gives you a lot of options, close to the wall, far away from the wall. And it has such a history. It's one of man's first you know, tools, te technical accomplishments, the arrow. And uh, it's still with us. And it's more now, um, you know, laden with all this romanticism. It's, it, it, as we know, it's in, uh, so many great paintings from the past have arrows in them, paintings of the goddess Diana, and we're going to get into Saint Sebastian, and, and uh, you know, all of the scenes from war and the Renaissance and, and all of that. So I, I just think it's a really great symbol that a lot of people have, uh, you know, feelings for. And you know, suddenly if you put two together, it's, it's kind of a relationship. And I like that about it. Here's a step back in time that connects to what I wanted to talk about using text. One day this summer, I got a package in the mail from my father, and it turned out to be this little pad of paper that my parents uh, had been using as a telephone, a makeshift, uh, do-it-yourself, DIY, telephone directory and interspersed with the phone numbers were my drawings and uh, you know, I was almost tempted to have many of show too many of those because they really were fun to, to see it was really heartwarming to to see but there was a lot of interest I'll just say about in those drawings about what was going on in my own little world that I was fascinated with the Wizard of Oz, the movie, and there was all these yellow winkies flying around, and witches, and uh, there was a lot of things on television with astronauts, and Lost in Space, that TV show, and so there was a lot of people you know, flying in these spaceships, and uh, planting American flags places, and it was so interesting to see what was going on, but when we're children, we're learning how to write, and 
uh, we're, we're, we're connected to both, uh, it starts first with drawing, we're making marks, we haven't learned how to write yet, and for so many people, once we learn how to write, we stop drawing. But this is kind of from a stage where it's sort of between, I'm, I'm aware that there's drawing and there's writing, I'm kind of turning, it looks like to me, my S's into something that is sort of fancy like a drawing. Uh, and doing something kind of fancy to the C's and stacking them. I don't think it's just necessarily about learning how to write Chris, but especially in the context that it's full, it's full of another whole other sketchbook of other drawings, makes me feel like that way about it. So I didn't really realize that I had this interesting text that went back you know, so far. This, I thought, would be a nice connection because it also uses my name. And these are relatively recent. In 2010, I finished my, my graduate program in the painting department at SCAD. And uh, I started this, this series of drawings that was kind of celebrating the fact that I had completed my goal and I had graduated. And I just thought that would be very humorous to sort of make it like a movie uh, uh, credit uh, of, you know, the MFA graduate starring Christopher Priori as the <laughs> student. <laughs> that just really struck me as really humorous. So I was developing that over about uh, 10 different drawings that were decidedly on nice paper. They were on watercolor paper because I wanted to make them with inks and to experiment with all kinds of washes and different nubs and like this is these are made, these lot, the thin lines are made with, you know, when you have the India ink and you pull out the lid and there's that nozzle, that little, that you can, you can push or not, and then there's the tip of that. It's using that to some extent. And these are with nibs, different nibs for calligraphy. I chose those three because I thought it showed three different, extremely different approaches to how to use the same materials in the same scale, in scale in the sense of the same size piece of paper. Now this is this is a very recent piece. I just made this in January, and it was in a group show in January at the. Uh, Loring Augustine Gallery in Chelsea. Uh, the, the theme was postcards. The show was called Postcards from the Edge. And uh, <clears throat> you know, I created a little narrative for myself with, with uh, what I would contribute. I made it especially for the show. And I gave myself a little uh, sort of assignment. Um, and which was that, that mine, I would use a real postcard, which seemed kind of like an obvious choice, but you know, almost nobody else actually did that. Um, but I would make it more special. I, I, I uh, used some gesso, and then there's luminescent, acrylic luminescent paint on that that gives that white sort of uh, shiny, ghost-like quality. And my idea was that, 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 the, that the lover had left this note for the other lover to find. My special one, please more time with you. Truly yours. No names, just ways of addressing each other. And then it's going back to my, my you know, sort of um, what's in my holster of well, I can paint the back of it with fluorescent paint. And I can't tell you how many arrows, I mean, uh, nails. I did so many studies. I painted so many nails with so many different colors, so many different 
uh, ways of layering just to get that, that right choice of, of that uh, particular blue nail. This uh, is an example of using drawings to look at other artists' work. Uh, and these are uh, just details from things that I thought were very interesting. Anselm Kiefer paintings in a show I, I saw in, in Berlin. And I, I understand that there's a show across the street at the Albright Knox that we should all see of Anselm Kiefer's paintings. But I loved how he had these hanging, dangling elements three-dimensional elements and <clears throat> just this this dried up weed was just stapled to this immense canvas uh, was so vulnerable like that uh, I thought that was charming and 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 it's the, the one on the left spoke to me with my interest in suspension and gravity which uh, you'll see coming up this is another one like that looking at a plaster bust that I saw in a museum in the south of France with the theme of Theseus conquering the, the, mon the Minotaur. There's all these amazing storylines that artists used to you know, gravitate to from history and from mythology, um, where we tend to more in the contemporary moment be, uh, it's more about our own experiences or commenting on the world, but uh, Artists often were doing that in the past via somebody else's story. Somehow they're in it uh, in a different way. So I'm sort of, by my copying but changing it with my own color scheme and my own sort of approach and writing into it and turning it into, you know, something kind of almost um, making fun of of this situation of what was very serious in this this bas relief of, of him conquering this animal. It's sort of more like, more contemporary with suddenly about animal rights and uh, you know, treatment of others that was not really thought of at the moment. You're like, go, go to kill a minotaur? Like, who, who, who does that? <laughs> so skywriting has been a big part of my, my uh, trajectory as an artist and I wanted to touch upon that a bit. This is a very old image. This is from one of my first projects. Uh, I uh, heard at school I was uh, this, the same age as many of you. I was a senior uh, and one of my professors made an announcement in class that the local Arts Festival in Pittsburgh, the Summer Arts Festival, was uh, still exists. Uh, it uh, was uh, it's a project of the Carnegie Museum of Art, Three Rivers Arts Festival. We're looking for public art proposals, and you kids should think about that. So I was very uh, aware of uh, that in that day of my own. Um, what I could bring to it and what I couldn't bring to it. And, and I was very aware of the fact that I really was more of a painting major. I didn't have a lot of sculpture skills to bring to, to the table at that point. I didn't know how to weld. I wasn't uh, that good at casting. Uh, I didn't really know how to, how do you make a big public piece that a lot of people will see in the physical realm? And we're used to public art that's big and metal and stone and people walk around it. So I didn't know what to do with that. And then I saw some skywriting going on in the sky. And I was like, oh, maybe that could be it. It's like the opposite of heavy. It's not on the ground. It's above. The viewer would look up in the air. It's like the opposite. And I don't know how to have to weld anything together. I just need to figure out how do you do this? So. You know, I, I made a, a very simple proposal. I can't believe they accepted it, but miraculously they did. And suddenly I was, uh, in my last semester, a working artist with a, uh, uh, with a commission. And it just totally changed my life because it really put air in my, my sails that I can be an artist and I can really do this after graduation.
This is actually the second year because the first year, the weather conditions were never right. And we went through all the paces where all my, they gave me a, dis a public display of all my drawings and preparatory studies and my little models and, and really you know, showcased the project, but the weather was really never right. So it never happened. And uh, then they carried the commission over to the next, the next year. But in between that, uh, you know, skywriting is best either in uh, when the sky is really clear, which is often in the autumn, with the cold air coming in, uh, clears out the clouds, or it can be good in, in, the, in the summer. And so in the fall, I, I, I did a, a series of projects in Dayton, Ohio. And, uh, and then that informed uh, you know, the following summer skywriting, because I had already you know, really done skywriting and made that happen. But what I wanted to say to you is, is that this is an example of artists collaborating with others. I think it's really important to be a good colleague, to network, to uh, create teams, to create uh, support systems for yourself. And suddenly I had to do that. You know, I had to, I had to work with, with the people who were, were, who were paying for it. I, I had to uh, work with the media. I had to find volunteer photographers and a videographer and you know, go outside of, of myself and my skill set. You multiply your own skill set by you know, working with others. I encourage you to think that way. <coughs> this is what I'm working on now with my scar writing. This is something that uh, hasn't happened yet, so you're amongst the first to see my, my ideas with this, but uh, what it is is to be uh, an inter international project called Amore Priore, uh, making a pun on my last name, and uh, it's writing the word love in different languages in different countries, uh, in topical, topical languages that would shift given the country. Uh, so if it happens over Jerusalem, it might have Hebrew and German for that kind of like tension of that, and it might have Iranian uh, or Persian mixed with it, uh, and things, you know, things like that that sort of create this topical postmodern sort of uh, commenting um, on uh, there's different words for love and different concepts of love. And it can be, um, it can be fading sometimes. I haven't done. I haven't made this yet, so I haven't. I haven't uh, right, no, but established all my relationships. Right? Ones, then, did you oh yeah. Have a conversation. Oh definitely. Oh, okay. <coughs> I went. To, I worked with uh, Air Ads of Dayton, Ohio, for the Dayton ones, and um, he really taught me about skywriting. And uh, I, w I went to Dayton t to meet with him, and um, you know he kind of. Uh, corrected me on, on my thinking about the scale and what was capable what is capable and um, it's easier to work you know parallel to the, the ground but some of mine were on an XYZ axis and that was a challenge to him but you can't do a nose dive but we could do diagonals at a slope so some of them I, I did incorporate what he thought was possible and he never had to do that because he was writing you know Pepsi in the sky and had clients like that. So doing something at an angle was something more unusual for him. But it's interesting how the proposals have changed because those were things that I hand painted on maps and, and made little wire models and things. And you know now I'm, I'm taking images or appropriating images and doing these in Photoshop. So Rapunzel's Village <clears throat> is a series that 
I, uh, I did when I was in, uh, in graduate school. Savannah College of Art and Design has a campus in Lacoste, which is it's a tiny uh, medieval village on a hill in uh, Provence in the south of France. And I was really just taking one class that quarter, which was installation art. And uh, quickly, luckily quickly, I came upon the idea that I was going to work with the existing spaces and uh, do something with hair, <coughs> hair that looked like it was growing out of a wall, out of walls. I started with one wall. And then by the end of the summer, it was good I was taking one class because it really morphed into like 13 different installations throughout the village, some of them with this long braid that I hand braided and put in different situations. And it worked with, again, with collaboration because, you know, I, I, I've always tried to be aware of what I'm good at and what I'm, you know, not so good at. And there's always people better at something so I can collaborate with them. Maybe we can do a barter perhaps, or, uh, or, or maybe you need to be paid, or you know, we'll figure that out. So in this case, I, uh, I hired one of the, my schoolmates who was a photography maker you know, to document the pieces. So that's an example of doing that. It's the same braid that in a different context. This one was able to last a long time and be up for, for three three weeks put on the side of this this beautiful facade and then uh, the school puts on towards the end of the summer a, a, a full-fledged open studio kind of exhibit of what the students have done all summer in multiple uh, classroom sites and halls and rooms and things and and uh, <clears throat> they had given me uh, there's a, a a door under here and you go in and there's this beautiful little small gallery space that they had given me as a solo show and so that this was above the entrance of that swishing in the wind and this was up quite a bit of the summer because I made this early on so that could, that wasn't bothering anybody in anybody's space so that could be that could just be uh, left up kind of a ominous <coughs> You know, back to again about creating your own story, like I did with the postcard. This was the story I had created was this this uh, butcher's wife who was very vain and, you know, nothing wrong with that per se, but she was interested in, you know, how she looked and she didn't have a lot of money, so she was taking interesting things from the fields and putting them in her braids and trying to be, you know, uh, sort of above her above her class, so to speak, and becoming ostentatious, and her, her husband was getting just tired of this and feeling embarrassed, and, and so uh, he cut off the braid and, and publicly uh, shamed her. But I wanted to give you some shots. It's always good, uh, FYI, you know, in a, in, a, in a portfolio to have some shots of installation of your work installed somewhere to make, you know, to make people that are looking at it know how it's gonna look in the real world. I definitely wanted to have some of that uh, for all of those reasons, but and also specifically uh, to help you understand, you know, how do you, how do you mount a show? I always, I like, uh, for s sometimes I like to do these salon type arrangements for walls of drawings of mine. You saw that earlier in a wall of drawings. These are, these are uh, 13 images from uh, my cast of characters of my different installations um, from Rapunzel's Village, sort of like a, a synopsis of it. <clears throat> it's another view that you see the photograph wall on the left and then, uh, and then a video that was playing of Rapunzel's Village during the show. You know, I said that my, uh, my family's been so supportive of me and, and uh, my uncle and aunt and, and cousin are 
before here today even came to Savannah for my thesis show opening. It was really beautiful to have him. And that was yet another way of showing, presenting, um, having it be outdoors, thinking big, had a jumbotron. <laughs>
that's another great example of collaborating and going outside of, of yourself because I really never could have made that out developing a team of, of, of people. Uh, I had never made a video before. I didn't know anything about sound design. And uh, I had a big learning curve with all of that. So I developed relationships with other, with other uh, schoolmates, uh, such as Kyle, who, who video, uh, video taped it. And uh, then we got back to Savannah. He and I worked for over a year. Uh, on s every Saturday, we would get together in the afternoon for a few hours looking at all this footage. It was like piecing together a collage and what images, and then get feedback on it uh, during the week, uh, and then um, keep going like that. And then after it was pretty much uh, in place, 90% in place, then um, bringing in the sound design. And that was a, a, a wonderful experience for me uh, with uh, Sean, who did the, the original score with the piano. Uh, I had never did some, done something like that before, that type of collaboration. And this, uh, what, did, what I did with that was sort of map out the emotional feeling I wanted with all the, there's like three, four major s sections to the video. What are the, gonna be the, the feeling that the music should give, the sound should give with that? And um, then he would work on something during the week, then I would, I would go listen to what he had heard on his respective Saturday, and then, you know, yes, no, that type of thing. And we came together with this expression that he had developed called "Don't break the spell." So uh, we never wanted to get too far from from the emotional uh, emotionality that I was going for, of kind of longing and uh, sort of bittersweet. Um, so not break that spell. The paintings have a sense of longing and, and desire and bittersweet and, and uh, joy and exuberance all at the same time. I like really having that spectrum of feelings in it. Um, the arrows are both being <coughs> supportive. They're supporting the, the work physically as well as uh, they're piercing it at the same time. So you have that duality of it's helping it, but it's also hurting it at the same time. Uh, so there's a complex relationship, and then sometimes the vinyl, the painted vinyl, it sort of gets the better of the arrow, and that the arrow, then the vinyl kind of wraps around it and sort of seduces the arrow sometimes too. This is a detail of a larger piece that we'll, we'll get to. And then uh, they're, they're, they're translucent uh, pigments I'm using, and, and so uh, light passes through them like stained glass and casts a colored reflection of the work on the wall. And that helps me, as I said before, about the drawing. It's a way of making the painting very site-specific. Wherever it goes, it attaches itself to the wall. <coughs> and it furthers the narrative because you have the, uh, the painting on the wall, the, the painting, you know, the re colored reflection on the wall. This is a... Uh, Little a solo show I had in Nashville. That gives you an I different ways that I've used the paintings and shows some reflections and shadows, scale differences. Are these all inspired by her? The the one on the one on the yes for the most part, not all of them in the room. The, the, Left, um, one on the left, it's kind of like back to the first, the first image I saw of the drawings of the hearts dangling. It's, you know, you've got this rectangle that it started out with of a painted piece of plywood, of a, a, of a vinyl. And then there's a heart, you can see, taken out. And that's hanging down. And then there's variations on that. So, uh, yes for that. And then you can't see it as well, but the large one, family tree in the back, um, that is, uh, that's comprised of, of three vinyl sections that were each in their own right started with that abstraction of it. And um, the one next to it to its left, uh, that one is, um, is a scrap from something else that I uh, cut and try to change the scrap as is there's a tiny one hook from a, a nail in the back but that's 
that's another one from the scrap. So I have a long history from, uh, in my 20s I was making paintings on plywood that used a lot of cutting and scraps and then I would rework the scraps. And so I have a, a lot of in my own, you know, uh, relation to my own artistic history about reworking my own scraps and, you know, reworking things like that. The painting of the of the 1500s, 1600s is really one of my favorite periods, and uh, I did want to make that connection to you to show you um, what was a, a very important theme in the, especially in the 1600s of Saint Sebastian. It was it was a storyline that uh, everyone who was anyone addressed Saint Sebastian. All the masters had done the Saint Sebastian. It was just sort of like. You have to have that notch in your belt. And um, this is Giuseppe de Ribera, who uh, was really working in Italy at the time, which southern Italy and Sicily was dominated by the Spanish. Uh, so he was uh, working in that <coughs> um, you know, colony of Spain, southern Italy and maybe it addresses to some degree his feeling of, a, of a, you know, an oppressed colonist to some extent. Back to how the artist injects their own, uh, their own narrative into the greater narrative. Paolo Vernese is one of my favorites. And also from this period, what I like a lot about is chiaroscuro. Does, does everyone know? Anyone want to tell us what that is? What I mean by that term? It's a mix of the dark and the light. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Chiaro, light, scuro, dark in, in Italian. And um, it was all the rage in that period. You know, it's just like um, Caravaggio was really credited with starting that. It began actually with some of the paintings of da Vinci and his background scenes, that, what they called sfumato, which was what he was doing. And then, um, you know, it had different schools of it. And um, back to, um, can I actually go back on that? Okay, well, but the, the this was sometimes called tenebrism, too, was, was when you really made it extreme. Like, uh, you know the painter Delatour, the French painter Delatour, his ex is really extreme chiaroscuro, and that that's uh, sort of a school within chiaroscuro called Tenet Prism. Stall. They all seem to be, uh, the arrows are aiming at the heart. Yes. But is there some, something there? Well, sometimes I wanted it to be really obvious and be in the heart, just with that, with that kind of, in our own culture of the hearts and arrows, which just was very uh, thoughtful of Philip to invite me this week with Valentine's Day. <laughs> 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 and this was this by Sam Gilliam. Does anyone know his work? Um, it, Sam created a sensation in the uh, late 60s and throughout the 70s with the idea of taking a canvas. A canvas had always been on a stretcher, as we know. Canvases are in stretchers. And then he liberated it from the stretcher, removed the stretcher, and started draping 
and making painting more of an installation type thing. And um, this is an example of that. Just say briefly, I've had the, 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 the wonderful opportunity and, and uh, privilege that uh, um, I met Sam when I was in my uh, mid-20s. Uh, I had finished school, I was living on my own, I was in my art career. Some more senior artists in Pittsburgh introduced us. He was, Sam was coming in from DC to teach a few, a few days a week at CMU. And uh, we had a dinner, uh, this group of people, and then, uh, then s soon after, Sam and I started having our own dinners and him coming to my studio. And that discourse has lasted, has lasted up to the present. It's, it's really been one of the most beautiful relationships uh, for me, and uh, like a father to me, and uh, uh, has given me really a master's in, uh, in art and art history, just listening on the phone. I didn't, I, our relationship is more of me listening and him talking and me giving him, giving him free reign to extemporaneously go from, the, it's hard to follow. I, I get only 60% of it. It's, it's like listening to a haiku or something. It's like going from cubism back to chiaroscuro to this, it's trying to keep up with this, this great mind, but it's just really been beautiful. And at uh, one point in that period, maybe I was 27, I was very interested in my own work with, with, with that chiaroscuro. And Sam came into the studio and he said, it's time to turn on the lights. <laughs> and <laughs> I shifted my, you know, I'm a very good son of obeying, you know, when I feel like this is the universe saying something. So. I, I shifted my palette immediately and it became very vibrant. Just like I finished up that next piece and went on to a series of very bright, vibrant colors. This would be developing a little scrap, turning it into a heart, making it do something vulnerable and funny at the same time, dangling like that. And then a whole assortment of these kind of scraps turned into their own finished pieces. Those would uh, tend to be um, kinetic too, wouldn't they? There'd be a lot of movement, I would imagine. Just with the air in the yeah. room, right? This is a large. The paintings I'm making at present are 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 much more clearly heart shaped. They're really going to look like you know, hearts. So this is a big rolled out sheet of of vinyl, of vinyl that I've been painting on the floor. I tend to work on the floor to kind of. You know, work with gravity, not fight gravity. Uh, pouring paint, trying to make it uh, mysterious as to how is this created? How did he do it? So I'm not telling you my secrets. <laughs> but one secret I will share is that I, I do, uh, for big things, I do uh, do studies, as you know, and then I, I can I can blow them up and, and grid them to really get it right. This is uh, you know, nine foot tall by four and a half feet. That's on the wall. It has yet to be you know, cut out from the rectangle. And then that whole step of getting it pierced with arrows and coming off the wall and lighting it. And so it's, it's like 70 first. So the painting part is mostly finished.
And this is what uh, I've been I, working on where literally this is my main studio wall. The one you just saw, that was done on the side wall to this, an adjacent wall. But this is my main work wall. And uh, literally, I measured it and then created a drawing to scale. And uh, I, I, I decided, could I, could I make three paintings on this? Or could I do four? And so I did, as you see, the separate piece of paper. I had all these different studies that when I finally settled on the three and the three that looked good together, not that these necessarily would have to be shown together, but I wanted them to look good for a studio visit, um, to show other people my work, um, like that. So that's where I was thinking with that. I settled on these three paintings. And then um, I literally gridded my studio wall after repainting it, physically gridded it with pencil, and then drew these with pencil on the wall and then putting the clear vinyl on top of the grid drawing and then drawing onto the vinyl, which will be the painting, and working that out. And then it's ready to go on the floor and paint it. This is, I don't think, can I go back? Yeah. The middle one is that one, which is in progress. And, um, that's just another use of a drawing. I'm drawing into it with uh, China markers. They're called, it's like a waxy crayon um, that the paint can go on top of that and then you'll see some drawing uh, underneath it. And then um, I decided to work on the edges first of this painting and work in, uh, never forgetting what Sam Gilliam would tell me about the leading edge of the painting. Still trying to figure out what does he really mean by that. Thank you so much.